Hello, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank the, the organizers um, for having this event uh, in a new form. Uh, of course, the coronavirus was around, so we all have to change a little bit our way of working. So uh, I'm very glad to, to start uh, this uh, presentation and to present some work that I do jointly with my students, Quentin Bertrand and Mathieu Armatias, along with uh, two other colleagues, Olivier Tarcoq and uh, Alexandre Renfort. So I will discuss uh, a lot about uh, connection between optimization and, uh, and statistics, and the talk uh, will be more specifically about square root lasso and extension to multivariate cases. Uh, to start, uh, first, uh, a little bit of a disclaimer. We're going to talk a lot about uh, neuroimaging. So in fact, I, I could have changed the title and, and, and just make this uh, a meg problem. So let's let's try to discover what's what in this context. So the MEEG inverse problem uh, refers to the problem of trying to infer signals inside the brain through magnetoelectric field uh, recordings. Uh, basically, you will put like a bunch of sensors, a few hundreds around your head, and try to localize the activity inside the brain. And often, depending on the discretization of the, the brain that you are targeting, you will get around like maybe 10,000 location you try to, to find. So this is a fairly hill post problem. The number of observation is really smaller than the number of parameters you try to identify. Uh, the motivation uh, are several, and uh, maybe the, the most important one is to identify the active regions that are responsible for the signals. And uh, of course, this can lead to uh, treatment for people suffering from epilepsy, uh, for disease, uh, coming from brain aging, like, um, uh, like the, the, the most uh, common one are Alzheimer, probably that you know of, and also for anesthesia risk. So it's a, it, it's a crucial uh, step for many reasons. All right. So let's see the, the, the physics underlying it. I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to give you like much details, but uh, the MEEG refers to two parts of the of the field. So the E in EEG uh, refers to the electric fields. So basically this has been around for about a century where you put electrodes on the brain and you just record what's going on on the surface of your head. So that's the, the, the part on the left. On the right part you will see here is something that is fairly more recent, probably it goes back to the 70s and it's a M uh, recording. So it's a magnetic field that you try to recover. And it requires some more uh, devices and are more expensive and more difficult to maintain because it requires like very low temperature to create the, uh, huge magnetic fields. So they are not so easy to find and you, you find them usually in big hospitals. All right, so just to look at how the magnetic uh, measurement, the MIG elements look like, basically you are in a, some kind of big chair where you put your head in, and around this, you will get many sensors trying to uh, like record the magnetic fields on one part, but there's also the derivative of the field. So in a way, the MEG has two kind of different components in the signal, and it's gonna be a bit different from the, the EEG part. Okay, so just, this is maybe uh, like a synthesis of what people are nowadays doing, as in fact, they are trying to record both kind of uh, fields at the same time. So basically you put the EEG on your head and then we put you in the machine and then you're probably gonna do some tasks like watching a screen or listening to some music or performing some simple uh, button pressing. And this is what we're gonna try to analyze, like the kind of signal you, you get from this. But let's try to, to, to model this in a statistical way. And in, uh, and, and the, the correct way to do that, we're going to see is through inverse problem. So first, uh, we're going to deal with the brain itself. So the brain itself, in our case, is going to be recorded through time and space. So here in red, uh, you see there is a time dimension, which is Q here, but should be T all around. So uh, you're never going to see Q anymore. And the space uh, direction is the discretization of the brain. So basically, you could think as this as pixels, uh, if you're familiar with imaging, or voxels, if you're familiar with 3D imaging. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be a little bit more complex than that. Uh, just uh, It's a discretization 
of um, more complex uh, space than just a grid, but this is about it. So you, you have this dimension uh, for the, the spatial resolution, okay? And basically, you will get a discretization that allows you to recover around like five millimeters regions in this uh, in this part. Uh, the second part, because we are more or less all familiar with linear models, we need the design matrix. And for that, uh, what we need is to create a matrix that will produce uh, a connection between the signal inside the brain and the signal that is recorded by is the EEG or the EMG sensors, all right? So uh, often in the literature, you might find a different name, so it could be referred to as a gain matrix or the forward operator, and they are mostly governed by Maxwell's equations. So they are produced uh, for us out of the box by uh, discretization of those equations, and we can get this big X matrix. So now on, I will just call it the, the design matrix, all right? So, what you get here is just, you create one point here, it spread out the, the magnetic field and what you will record is either here on the EMG part or the EEG here, what's uh, emitted by this source, all right? And now if you reconnect everything together, uh, the simplest model that you can come up with is some kind of uh, big linear models. So we, I will try to use it standard notation so you will get Y is a signal that you record either on the EEG part or on the MEG part. So it has two dimensions, the number of sensors, which is N. Basically, it's either 100 or about 100 or maybe a few hundred if you, if you take all the sensors. Then there is a time duration. So depending on the duration of the experiment, it could be a, a few time stamps. So the order of magnitude is usually about 100 or so and uh, the unit is more or less like milliseconds. And now, like what you would try to explain is how uh, Y can be composed by just two quantities. So it's the signal coming from the brain going through the forward operator or the design matrix. And of course, you will add some noise B to just account for the inaccuracy of the sensors and of the modeling itself, okay? And I have to say that in fact, thanks to the physics, the linear model is a fairly re reasonable assumption to, to perform in this case. Okay. All right, but a last step maybe in this is uh, the noise level is very strong when you do this kind of experiments. So for instance, if the person is watching a screen and try to like identify a cross or whatever, uh, due to this noise, we ask usually the patient to perform some repetition. So, in fact, you won't observe only one of the models that I showed you here in the previous slide, but you will record like many, many times this. How many would be the number of repetitions, small r in the following, and r could be depending on the time and the difficulty of the task, about a few tens or a few, like maybe the, the maximum would be like 50 or something. So the idea is just you will recover different repetition of the task itself. So you will get this matrix Y1, Y2, Y3, YR that you will, uh, you will collect. And I, I'll come back on that later on. So just to, to make the model even more precise, uh, X and Y are divided together uh, in three parts. The first part is the EEG component. So it's the same for X and Y. The division is, uh, is in parallel. Then you got the graduometer part which is the first component of the magnetic field, and then you get the amplitude of the magnetic field. So the matrix X and Y are very structured. One difficulty with that is uh, due to the different units and due to the different uh, resolution of those uh, sensors, the structure of the noise is also very different depending on the channels that you're considering. So here I'm displaying the three kind of information you record. So in the top, you got the EEG, then the graduometers from the MEG, and then the manometers from the MEG itself. So what you see here are the number of sensors. So you get 59 for the, the EEG, 200 for the graduometers, and 100 for the channel. So that's, that's about N is the sum of those three components, if you want. 
And what you can see here are several curves, and those curves are basically the repetition I showed you before. So here you get probably uh, 55 repetitions or something like that. Uh, but let's see on the right part the correlation structure of the nodes. And you see that due to the construction of the sensors themselves and the connection they had together, you can check that really the covariance structure of the noise is, is really like different from one to another. And this might be like one of the elements we want to take into account in what follows. <clears throat> so let's see a second specificity of this that I already mentioned. So you get those repetition that you want to perform to increase like the noise resolution. And the reason for that is that you will be able to gather them together, so average them probably to make the signal to noise ratio uh, in favor of your analysis, okay? So you would take sometimes Y bar to be the average of those uh, different L matrices, okay? Uh, and th this is what is commonly done in, the, in this field, okay? Uh, just before I maybe, sorry, I would just go to this one, uh, but one uh, point with the number of repetitions is it's, it's important because we all are statisticians, so we know that if you increase the repetition number, you will get like a, a cleaner and cleaner signal, which is illustrated in this. So for instance, I showed you the same kind of experiment with five, 10, and 50 repetitions. So you can see that now is emerging some signal around here. Uh, and just for the time, what you should know is usually there is some kind of stimuli performed at zero, and then you get the time of response from your brain, and you see this kind of activity emerging and then maybe spreading out for time. Okay, but the difficulty is uh, the subject, the patient, uh, will endure some kind of fatigue through the experiment. So basically you cannot put this person too long in, in the device because you will get used to the task, you will get bored, or maybe you're too sick to stay like for a very long time in this. So you cannot really hope to, to make this like 1,000 repetition. You have to like play with a, a limited budget in a way, in terms of the, the patient time. All right, so let me just uh, summarize uh, the notational part. Uh, it's a bit cumbersome, but I think it's fairly convenient uh, for people used to this kind of linear models. So N will be the number of sensors observation. T, which are sometimes referred to task, uh, in the multitask setting that I'm gonna describe later on, uh, here is for us uh, the time. And P, is a number of features, which is consistent with the statistical literature, and R is going to be the repetition number, all right? And so we will record Y1, YR, so there are R n times T matrices that we collect over one kind of uh, experiment or patient analysis. And so our model is the following, YL, for all of those L's I mentioned, is equal to X B star plus S star E L. So E L is a noise, so it's just standard Gaussian noise, centered and normalized. And S star is some kind of co-standard deviation, so it's not really the covariance as uh, is usually uh, described in the model, it's rather like the square root of this kind of matrix. Okay, and that would be exactly the standard deviation if it was uh, in 1D. Uh, disclaimer, so this is a positive semi-definite matrices, and also I would sometimes use this notation, so if you see this kind of notation for a matrix that is symmetric, basically I mean that the spectrum of S has all uh, its values B uh, above, sorry, sigma underscore, okay? And so it means that S minus sigma underscore identity is semi-definite positive. All right, and of course I haven't mentioned it, but B star is the target we have in mind. We want to recover the, the, the signal structure. So let's see uh, how we can do that. And for that, we're gonna leverage sparsity and, and multitask averaging. The sparsity uh, has been everywhere for, I would say about 20 years or something, maybe even more. Uh, and I'm sure like this audience is, uh, is aware of that. Uh, so sparsity, here means that we can represent signals with a few atoms. So it, it started maybe with Fourier decomposition for sounds. Uh, in the 90s, the wavelets became very popular. So it was also something where you could take a few coefficients and reconstruct a, a perfect 
not really not a perfect, but a, a very good or fairly good approximation of an image. And later on in the in the year 2000, or even if it started a little bit earlier with Olsen and, uh, and Field, uh, people tried to start learning this kind of representation of an image and, and, and led to dictionary learning. Here, in our context, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, what we're going to do is try to measure or try to, sorry, represent the, the signal as a few components in the brain. So basically, we believe, or there are good reasons to believe, I just mentioned a reference later on, that the measurement uh, can be fairly well explained by a few active brain sources if you perform a simple task. So, and, and this is the case in, in the kind of experiment that are given in the MEG uh, literature. So the motivation for the sparsity is coming from uh, more or less the physics, and uh, it's like here, where is my limit on this uh, physical interpretation? But you can represent basically uh, with dipolar pattern focal sources. So it means that if you have short duration and you do simple connective task, and of course that the repetition of experiments are average out uh, for, for the other sources, then if you perform some kind of ICA, you will check that it's reasonable that you recover a few dipoles uh, that they can represent the signal. So basically, so those dipoles are just, if you put one source in the brain and you look at the electric and magnetic waves, you will see this uh, dipolar uh, uh, spread. So at least it's now uh, legitimate and uh, people have been playing with that uh, in the last 10 years or so in this, uh, in this field there. Uh, the, the signal uh, at stake here could be well approximated by sparse combination of uh, dipole representation. But now let, let's go a little bit uh, further. Uh, let's see which kind of assumption we want to recover uh, the B matrix. So uh, I remind you that the B matrix has a time component and a special component. So the time is here uh, on the rows and the source is on the column. So if you were trying to recover some signals uh, due to the size of it, and I remind you like n and t are 100 times 100, and so it's uh, n is uh, the, the samples, and p, the features, might be huge. It might be like 10,000 or something like that, or at least a few thousand. So you would need some kind of regularization to recover some active signals. Okay, so uh, it's common to perform some kind of uh, penalty or regularization to, to try to, to recover the signal. So if you start with a simple Gaussian model, of course you want to do a quadratic data fitting where F here is for the Frobenius norm, and then you make some regularization. So if you start with a pure and simple L1 regularization, basically you enforce some kind of activation that are not necessarily consistent uh, through times. So what is more natural in this context is to say, okay, if we are doing a short period analysis, we believe that if one source is activated during the experiment, it's more or less active for the whole experiment. And for that, you can just use a 2-1 norm. So this is the sum over all the features or over all the rows of the L2 norms of the row. And this will enforce uh, this uh, sparsity pattern inside the matrix to occur. And of course, you could be imagine like refining this, but we we are gonna we're not gonna go on that road in this in this talk, even though it's it's possible to do maybe like sparse group or, or something like that. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, let's see uh, what what people have been performing. Uh, so far is basically using the average signal I mentioned earlier. So you take all the repetition, you average them, and then you fit them to a multitask class of uh, estimates. And this is what, what I've been doing. Um, in a way, it would be kind of interesting to say, oh, but what about we take as the fitting term, not the error on the average, but taking the average error and regularize. Because it could be a way to try to enforce some information from each separate experiment that you have been performed and not taking only one uh, summary of it. 
Uh, in fact, if you do that, it's some kind of failure. Uh, you will recover exactly the same solution. So this is not necessarily interesting. And, and we'll see that we will have to consider a different data fitting term so that this part is not going to produce the same estimator as, as the first one. And so for that, I will do a long detour. Uh, I think this is for some of you maybe a, a little bit unknown. So it, it, it drives some connection between uh, the square root lasso, uh, the concomitant lasso, and some smoothing from the optimization theory. Uh, and I will define the concomitant and the square root lasso if some of you don't don't know what it is. So first, just a, a quick recap in the, in the vectorial case. Uh, this, I'm sure, like everybody knows, it's just a lasso. So it's as a square root, sorry, a square data fitting, an L1 regularization, and lambda is as we have used before a regularization parameter that will control the degree of uh, sparsity that you obtain uh, in your output beta hat. Okay, and so if lambda is large enough, you will recover some very sparse solution. Well, in fact, if it's too large, you will get zero. So you, you have to refrain from taking it super big, but uh, that's a different story. Okay, so this has been around for like 25 years now. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a, a very popular tool, and it, it's been analyzed uh, fairly precisely during the 2000 and 2010. And here I'm giving just one uh, kind of re result, which is um, a prediction error uh, under some simple assumptions. So you have this linear model where there is a noise component here. So sigma star is the unknown noise level. So it's a uh, the standard deviation of the noise, and this is Gaussian, so it's, uh, it's the simplest you can uh, you can check. So under some very uh, intricate conditions, which are like of many many uh, different names, I took here uh, this restricted eigenvalue property following uh, Bigel, Ritoff, and Sibakov, and choosing correctly lambda. So basically, it should be proportional to square root of log p over n times the level of the noise. Then you will find uh, a prediction error, which is more or less rate optimal. So you will have log p over n here, s star, which is a sparsity of the vector beta stars that you target. Then you will get the noise level to the square, so the, the, the variance of the noise itself. And then here you pay a price for the conditioning of the problem. And this is a restricted eigenvalue constant that you get here. And delta is the confidence that you want to get. So you have to plug it in here and you will get this bound with a high probability one minus delta if you do that. So this is like good news. Uh, basically you are reaching up to log term the minimax lower bound, but the, the price for that is uh, that you don't know yet what is sigma star that you have in practice. So this is a big deal here because you don't know lambda if you don't know sigma star. And so you cannot really use this. So it's more like a, a theoretical tool uh, than, than anything else. So people have come up with a different solution and I will discuss like the square root uh, version for that. But uh, let's see maybe uh, instead of going for uh, the theoretical motivation for the square root, I, I give you a, a practical one. Uh, imagine you're choosing lambda by cross-validation. And I told you like lambda should be proportional to sigma star if you were using the lasso here. Okay, and if you check on a simple simulation case, so I took the simple model where X are IID Gaussians in the columns and, uh, and you check what the influence of lambda. So here I will put different values of lambda depending on the signal to noise ratio. And those are like the values find by cross validation. And you can see that with the signal to noise ratio, you got a linear like that fitting term, which is not so bad. And basically, this is what you expect from Siri. Like it should be proportional to this uh, to this element. And now, if you do what is called the square root lasso, and the only difference is you remove the square here, and maybe you change the parameter here, uh, which is uh, it could be hidden in the lambda choice. So it, it, it's something that is up to the statistician to, to model that way. Well, basically, if you do this, 
So performing the square root transformation uh, show that in theory, you will discover that lambda should not necessarily be proportional to sigma star, so it is adaptive to the unknown value. And in fact, if you perform in practice, now the same kind of uh, cross-validation and look at what is the value of lambda, you see that it's fairly constant across the signal to noise ratio or across the sigma star value. So basically, you, you find now something that is uh, maybe more uh, easy in practice to, to, to manipulate, even though I, I, I might come back on that point uh, later on. Okay, but so this is a, a bit surprising because the previous one, if you look at the lasso case, uh, this is the maximum likelihood estimation with a regularization, whereas here we have a, a very different uh, like data fitting term, which is maybe surprising for those who have never seen it. Okay, so let's see where it's coming from. And its connection is coming from uh, what is uh, referred to in the literature as a concomitant lasso. Uh, and the oldest reference I found was uh, from Owen in 2007. Uh, but the idea goes back to Huber, in fact, in the, in the 70s. And the idea is uh, we can more or less interpret the square root lasso with this formulation as a problem where you get two components, the beta, the coefficient that you're targeting, and the noise level sigma that uh, you're suffering from. And basically what you're doing is just performing an L1 regularization, but your data fitting term now has two components. One component where you get the quadratic data fitting term, but you divide it by sigma, and then you add a penalty on sigma. And in most cases, so basically uh, when the residual is different from zero in the square root lasso, well, basically those are the same solution. So this is good news because this is a jointly convex problem as also was the square root lasso. Uh, but this is not a smooth problem in the sense of optimization. I mean, you will get some problem around zero. Uh, it's basically, you, you cannot get like a, a Lipschitz gradient because there is an explosion around zero. So this might be a, an optimization issue in this case. Okay, and, and behind you, you'll see like where is the convexity coming from and it's coming from the analysis of the quadratic of a linear function, a square over b that is described here. That looks like a little bit like a boat, if you want, but it's a, it's a convex function. Uh, but now if you do a very simple trick, and we work on that with my student Eugene Ediang like a few years back, uh, and you put uh, a lower bound, sigma underscore, you make this a smooth function now, and you control the smoothness by this term. And I will try to motivate this uh, in, the, in the coming slides. And, and for that, I will maybe refer to this phenomenon as the uberization of uh, the, the square root lasso. And the way to see that is uh, to borrow some ideas from the optimization community and especially uh, inspirational work are from Beck and Tebul and like the pioneering one was from Nesterov in 2005. And the idea is the following. Basically, if you want to approximate the solution of an optimization problem where this part is non-smooth, well, you might just smooth the function. So imagine this is the absolute value. Well, you will just provide an approximation that is smooth. And in fact, this is uh, an Uber function of a kind, uh, just shifted with respect to the original one. And the formula here is not necessarily important, but what is important is basically you can represent the smooth function here up to this error sigma underscore by performing this optimization. And so basically you can substitute this term by the minimization over a new variable sigma of something which is what is used in the concomitant lasso formulation. And this would provide the, the exact uh, formula I gave you before for the smooth version of the, the concomitant. Uh, and another way to understand this is just to say, okay, my original function was just norm divided by square root of n. And what I want to do is to smooth it. So I will use an operator that I'll define just very soon, which is the nth convolution. And I will provide some kind of kernel that will smooth my function. And we try to make this uh, a bit clearer in the in the coming part. So let's see what is this uh, infimum 
convolution uh, operation doing. So basically, uh, if you take two functions that are reasonable convex closed, uh, just to be precise, you take f and g, and you want to see what is this simple convolution. It's just the infimum over u of f u plus g of x minus u. So it's basically the same as if you like play with the usual convolution, except you will substitute the integral by an nth and the multiply sign by a plus sign. Okay. And as if you were playing with Fourier analysis or kernel smoothing, you will provide and write uh, a smooth version of the function f at the level sigma underscore as the following. You will choose a kernel omega. You will perform some kind of dilatation of this. So you have an interpretation of sigma underscore as a bandwidth. And you will do this inf convolution with the original function. And just to give you some visualization, I come back to the second part later on. Just imagine you choose the kernel function as the simple quadratic t square over two, and you want to smooth the absolute value function. And then if you choose, for instance, sigma underscore is equal to 2.5, this is the kind of function you will get. If you take a smaller value, the approximation gets better. And now you see like the, this one is uh, with sigma underscore is equal to one. And then if you make it smaller and smaller, now you tend to like be like, very, it's difficult to tell apart like the, the smooth approximation and the original function, okay? And just, I'll come back to the second part of this slide because I think uh, for those, and most of us are familiar with the Fourier analysis and uh, the kernel smoothing techniques. Basically, you know that if you're performing some uh, Gaussian smoothing, what you're doing is just taking a function, an original function, convoluting it with the kernel, and you rescale this using a bandwidth parameter, okay? And the important properties of the Fourier transform are the following that you use. Basically, it's a morphism. So if you take f star j, the convolution in the Fourier domain is just a multiplication of the Fourier transform. And then the Gaussian is a very specific uh, kernel, if you want, in the sense that it's up to scaling uh, a fixed point of the Fourier transform. Okay, so this is for the maybe more uh, analysis part. Now, if you go to optimization, the not equivalent, but a, a, a similar transform that is very uh, popular and used is the legend transform. So I'm not going to describe it uh, in detail, but basically it has some in, interesting uh, connection with the inf convolution operator. And it, in the same way that you could have a morphism, uh, in the convolution, this is the same for the nth convolution. You will get that f square g transform is the same as having the sum of the two transforms, okay? And then the equivalent of the Gaussian kernel would just be the squared norm divided by two, which is also a fixed point of this transform. And then the way we perform the kernel smoothing here, it just like a very similar, it just like, a, there is a little bit of a difference in the way you, you perform the multiplication here, but otherwise it's just the, the same kind of uh, component. So I described the, the first original Uber function that I showed you here, but in fact, you could do this with a different kernel. So I'm using, for instance, this one, which has some connection with the concomitant estimation we're playing with. And what you get is just an approximation by the top instead of by the bottom. And so this is sigma underscore is equal to 2.5. And if you make this smaller and smaller again, you recover a better and better approximation of this function. Okay. So basically you can smooth all the norms. I showed you like this is the absolute value, but it works for norms and we have used that for the square root. But uh, more interestingly, uh, following, or maybe not following because we discovered this after playing uh, practically with the, the, the kind of, uh, techniques that I'm going to describe next, but uh, Sarah van de Geer introduced uh, the square root lasso for the multivariate case. And in fact, we're going to see that what you need now is to smooth the nuclear norm. So here, this is uh, the Schatten norm one or nuclear norm or trace norm. And uh, if you want to play with this estimator, you also face the same problem. This is non-smooth term 
and you also have a non-smooth term coming from the, the the regularization. And so we'll see how to smooth this and uh, the kind of result it leads to. Okay, so this is in the in the, in the coming slide. Uh, and the same idea as before would uh, would be uh, relevant here uh, in the same place. Uh, the only difference is just now, basically what we're going to do is to apply this kind of smoothing in the spectrum of the matrix itself. So if Z is a matrix, N times T, and you have this uh, decomposition of singular values, the trace norm is the sum of these singular values of Z. Okay? And so what you want to do now is just try to smooth this kind of function. And how can we do that? Well, we can reuse the same kind of operation using the imp convolution, using the same kind of kernel. So here uh, it's not described, but it's a probability norm. And so if you perform that, well, basically you are doing the uberization, but of the spectrum itself. And if you play a little bit with algebra, you can rewrite this in the following uh, optimization formulation. So basically, the smoothing of the Shatten norm could be written as a minimization problem over a matrix. So S here is this kind of co-standard devi uh, deviation matrix I mentioned earlier. And uh, you try to find the one where the spectrum is uh, bounded by below by sigma on the score. And it's the minimum of the sum of two terms. So one is a data fitting term. It's a Manalobius distance. So it's just a trace of Z transpose S minus one Z. And the second part is, again, a regularization on the spectrum of S. So you take the trace uh, of S. So you, you will try to make S with uh, like the smallest possible uh, eigenvalues. All right. And this uh, was proposed in, a, in our contribution to NERIPS last year. So basically now, once we have done that, we, what we could do is try to go back to our problem and try to do this smoothing either on the average signal we mentioned. So we use the data fitting term that I just described be before here and try to find the signal and the cost on deviation that are minimizing this uh, joint uh, convex formulation. So here I plug the average signal, but in fact, what we realized once we had this kind of formulation is now we can also do it, but on the repetition wise level. So basically we can average the errors of the model and take this into account on a repetition level and then perform the same kind of regularization. And I will call this CLAR in the, in the following for just concomitant lasso with, uh, with repetition in this, uh, in this context. And so of course this one you're gonna see is, uh, is more relevant in the scenario we have in mind. So just to uh, motivate this, I, I give a, a short simulation analysis. So we took some fairly simple model where X is a Gaussian with a topic structure. Here, the size are kind of vaguely similar to our problem. So N is 150, P is 500, T is 100. And uh, X is top leads, as I mentioned. And we're gonna take a true co-standard deviation structure, which is also top leads, and see the influence of all those parameters on different methods. So the two methods in green are the one I just presented in the previous slide. The multitask lasso in uh, yellow is the one I first introduced and which is uh, the most uh, commonly used in this community. And the other one are uh, maximum likelihood estimation, either the vanilla one or the one with repetition taking into account. And this one is a more recent one where the details are given in the appendix where you add some, uh, some regularization on top of the usual uh, L1 uh, regularization of the, the, the signal itself. So there is a, an additional regularization on the sigma in this model. So let's see uh, what's going on here. So on the first line and the two lines are different. So the, I start with this one. So here uh, we make varying the number of repetition. So basically one repetition, 20 and 100 repetition. So what you see is first, if you have very few repetition, uh, the performance, so here you got false positive rate and true positive rate. And if you're down, it's bad. And if you up, it's good. So when R is equal to one, uh, all the methods are fairly awful. 
So you, you don't really get much of the signal uh, and you don't recover much. But as you increase the number of repetition, of course, uh, the task becomes simpler and simpler. And except that one that seems to have like some uh, parameter issues, uh, all those methods are having uh, better and better performances, okay? Which is normal and this is what you expect. Like you would like the people to stay uh, and repeat the same uh, experiment all, all the time. So there, there is a good reason why you want to increase uh, the repetition. And if you compare, uh, the two that are interesting to compare are the arrows and the squares. So the one where you take into account the repetition and the one where you take into account only the average signal. And you see that overall there is always like a win by going from uh, using the average to using the repetition here and here. And this is the same here. And here, okay, it says striking, but you still get this kind of, uh, of benefit. And overall we, like, either uh, have the same performance as the uh, like other methods or a little bit of improvement. But uh, I would say it's not significant at this, uh, at this stage. All right, so just a, a quick uh, few words uh, before we wrap up. Uh, I will just try to describe the optimization algorithm itself and, and give some insight on the, on the statistics. So first, the good news is that for the SGCL and the PLAR, that are the two estimators I presented before, uh, there are convex problems. So the good part with that is they are at the same time convex and smooth. So you can perform all the like, standard algorithm for those, uh, those methods. And so you can perform alternate updates. Basically you can fix the signal and, uh, sorry, update the signal and fix the cost standard deviation and then fix the signal and update the cost standard deviation. So if you do the first, so trying to update B, uh, you can reuse a multitask lasso solver. And I'll show you in the next uh, slide that there is basically, if, if you add like something solving uh, this problem, then you have nothing to add. The second part is a little bit different. Uh, if you fix B and you try to update S, you need to solve a problem that has this kind of structure. And what it, requ it requires, basically, and we mentioned that, we are smoothing the, the, uh, the trace norm. So we need to basically compute an eigenvalue decomposition or an SVD, either of the average residual or on the average of the, uh, sorry, on a covariant structure of the residual or a covariant structure of each repetition of the residual you get, okay? And so for more detail, uh, I, I give you like this uh, uh, GitHub uh, where Quentin Bertrand put, uh, put the code online and just show you like that this code is not so long uh, in the end. And uh, you'll see the inputs are the one that I've already mentioned. And the only thing that needs a little bit of explanation is the step where you do this uh, S update and you need to perform a spectral clipping and a square root of the eigenvalues, basically to change the well, to, to make it homogeneous and to have the correct, uh, the correct order. Okay, so basically if you take like the repetition one, so the CLAR version, you compute the average of those correlations matrices or covariance matrices, and then you shrink the spectrum at level sigma underscore after performing a square root. And then for the updates of the betas, well, you can just do like block coordinate descent and visit row by row and perfect some blocks, blocks of thresholding. So it's very similar to what you do for uh, the lasso, for instance, except it's a block instead of uh, just uh, one component at a time. Okay. Uh, and one, one, one thing that is, of course, could be a limitation is just since you need to do this eigenvalue decomposition or this SVD, depending on N that you are targeting, it might be prohibitive. Uh, here we are in a situation when N is fairly big, but not so big. So this is not like uh, damaging and, and we can uh, we can proceed. All right, and, and just like before uh, closing this uh, this talk, uh, the, the last part, which is of interest is uh, we can analyze in a simple setting some of the property of this estimator that I mentioned. So there is just for the theory a, a little modification. We need an upper bound on the S matrix that we consider in the estimator. Uh, in practice, this is never rich. 
So we, we don't really see any issue with the, the upper bound. Uh, you can make it like a little bit bigger and, uh, and not, uh, you, you don't saturate this. So it, it's, uh, it's mostly for the analysis. And so under the IIG Gaussian noise, so all those components of the underlying noise are uh, sigma star squared uh, in terms of variance and uh, centered mean. If you take X having a mutual incoherence property, which I'm not describing in detail here, but if you're interested, the slides uh, online will uh, have the definition uh, properly, but basically this is a cruder uh, requirement than the one we had for the restricted eigenvalues. And then choosing lambda proportional to square root of log p divided by t times square root of n. Uh, and I really want to emphasize that this is independent of the noise level sigma star that you don't know. And under some uh, reasonable assumption on the, uh, the choice of the sigma bar and the sigma underscore that you put in your algorithm, so basically sh they should not be too far away from the true target. So this is a bit of a limitation, but uh, uh, we're gonna pay the price of the error that you, you have here. Then with high probability, uh, what we're gonna get is um, an error bound, which is a two infinite norm. So basically uh, this is the infinite norm of the L2 norm of the rows of the matrix. And this is controlled at the minimum X rate up to log term. So it's one over t times square root of log p over n. And of course you pay the price of the sigma star here. So the good news is this uh, is a tool that can be used to perform uh, rows identification. So if you want, you can derive from this um, uh, a support recovery bound. And that was our uh, motivation in the first place. Okay. All right. And just before uh, closing, like the last part is just showing on a very uh, like realistic scenario uh, the influence of the, the method that we propose. So basically I, I took like the same candidates minus one. So I take the CLAR, which was the, the one we proposed. Uh, and all those were variants of the MLE, so maximum likelihood uh, with some regularization and using repetition or not, and with an additional regularization term which was introduced last year, okay? And so the scenario is you, we took uh, real data. So this one is with uh, auditory cortex. So people are listening to some uh, specific sounds and we try to analyze what, which part of the brain is, uh, is activating. So for that, we needed to like, put all those methods on the same uh, kind of scale. So what we decided was to say, what would happen if we took only two sources? So it means that we could choose lambda for all those methods so that two sources only would be activated and look at where are those sources, okay? And basically one of the reason why my uh, practitioner friends were happy was just that this part around here and around here are on the auditory cortex. And so they, they would be like meaningful information as this one also would be like kind of okay, except that you don't recover this on the, on the right hemisphere. So this is a, they are missing some part here. And then some of those methods were like vaguely relevant, uh, especially that one, which identifies something like way too far from the, the original sources. And sometimes it could be even like too deep in the brain so that you, you won't necessarily see that. And the MTL also multitask class so had the same issue where uh, basically you're missing the source on this side of the side of the hemisphere, all right? Okay, so I think it's time to conclude. Uh, for that, I just wanted to like cite sometime my, my good old colleague, Alexandre Grandfort, and so to just mention that all models are wrong, but some come with good open source implementation and good documentation, so use them. Uh, and I mean, the disclaimer is that the code would be here and feedback would be highly appreciated. And if you are looking for maybe more details, you can just browse like our either personal pages or just go on our code and you'll find that. All right. Uh, I leave you with uh, some of the references that you will find behind and if you want like at the end of it we get like some extra information especially the definition of the assumption that were made that you will find here and also like the definition of the different competitors that we compared with. All right. And with that uh, we just thank you all for your attention and your patience to go through this uh, long talk. Thanks. <laughs>